the deadline when there is no justice. This man is the law. 10 to midnight. Charles Bronson, Lisa Eilbacher, and Andrew Stevens in a Golan Globus production of a J. Lee Thompson film. Welcome to That's Canon, to a podcast talking about the Canon film series and other similar movies. This is episode 20, and I'm your host, Phil. And I'm Greg. And we're back with our good buddy, Charles Bronson. Oh, Chucky B's back. I gotta, I gotta say, I think the more that I watch Charlie Bronson, the more <laughs> I like him. Yeah, he's got... I remember when we first watched Death Wish, he, and, and that was the first Charles Bronson movie that I've ever seen. He had this kind of... He seems kind of wooden, almost. Like, he doesn't really have a whole lot of charm or emotion kind of coming through, but... You're right. I think he grows on you. He's got a charm all his own. And it, it sort of comes out in subtle ways. And then like more like, like the looks that he gives people throughout movies. I think he definitely works in the movies that he tends to do. Yes. I think this is definitely a good example of that. Uh, I thought he was I thought he was pretty fantastic in this movie. And I yeah. want to say and lots of people were too. Yeah. I want to say he was a, a little more subdued in this one, which I could appreciate. Right. Um, Ten to Midnight is a movie that was originally released in 1983. It was directed by J. Lee Thompson. Um, don't really know too many more of the movies uh, that they've directed, though they are a Academy Award nominated director. Directed The Guns of Navarone, uh, Ice Cold in Alex, and Women in a Dressing Ground. Dressing gown, dressing ground, women dressing ground in a dressing gown. Now, <laughs> that's not to say that this person obviously isn't popular. It's just unfortunately, this was the first movie that I've ever acknowledged the existence of this director. Yeah, they have existed through three decades. So, wow, lots I mean, of a- movies to watch and things to look back at. And you know what? I'm about to take that back, Greg. Because I'm looking at their IMDb. <laughs> Conquest of the Planet of the Apes and Battle for the Planet of the Apes is a movie by J. Lee Thompson. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, those those later ape sequels weren't uh weren't, off, weren't gems, were they? I think the one where <laughs> sidebar, I think the one where <laughs> it's the apes finally revolt against the humans. And it's in like the dystopian future where uh, yeah. the apes aren't pets anymore. They're like criminals. They're all in the orange jumpsuits and stuff. I yeah. think that one is really good. Uh, it's the one after it battle for the planet of the apes. That one is kind of cheesy because it takes place in like a tree house. Yeah, I <laughs> I saw those. all. I've only seen them all once. And honestly, they all blur together. I barely remember what you're talking about. So I'll have to take your word for it. We'll have to do like a. <laughs> apes retrospective one day there we go welcome to apes cast we <laughs> talk about the apes movies i get i get sit down and and do that i am a big fan of those i'm a big fan of the remakes too yeah the, the, or the, the prequel trilogy i guess those were way better than they had any business being oh obviously. yeah they're definitely not to thumb your nose at them that's for sure and you know what i, I know. uh we're getting off track here but i think <laughs> that the first one actually is the worst one in that in that yeah, series they, they only get better yeah. i would argue that the middle one is the best but the the last one was fantastic also yes they really did just get better i think the middle one is the best as well it goes two three one. Oh man but yeah seriously people listening if you haven't seen <laughs> the the newer planet of the apes movies rise dawn and war for the planet of the apes go check them out they're surprisingly worth your time yes very very good very much like this movie, but in a similar or not a similar manner, but a different manner. Yes. Uh, Surprising and worth your time. Yes. Ten to Midnight is a movie about Charles Bronson, who plays Leo Kessler. <laughs> no, it's just about Charles Bronson. We're just going to call him Charles Bronson. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Uh, for the rest of the, 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 the review. He is a LAPD detective. So he's he's back in his wheelhouse. He's doing exactly what he does best. He's right. an LAPD detective. And, I, you know, I kind of I appreciate any actor that realizes their limitations in what they what they're good at. Right. 
Yeah. Well, and like I said before, like I think this is the perfect role for Charles Bronson. And it's it's similar enough to his Death Wish kind of personas, but I think this definitely plays to the Charles Bronson strength for sure. I'm glad you said Death Wish, even though I know we've only talked about Charles Bronson and Death Wish because there's a Death Wish moment in this movie. Uh, yes. So I'll, I'll definitely get into that too. I had, I had strong Death Wish feelings from this too. A hundred percent. The movie opens up. Charles Bronson's behind a typewriter. Uh, typing up some kind of a report and there's a mm-hmm. reporter, his name is Jerry and he's pressuring Bronson for some information. It really doesn't mean anything to the entire plot of the film. It just shows that Bronson's a tough as nails uh, LAPD detective. And he even says he's a mean son of a bitch and what he <laughs> wants comes first and what he wants is a killer. Dun, 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 dun. And that's where we get the, the action movie opening credits, yes. red text over black. So great. So great. Then we cut to. Oh, by the way, we get it. I think it's been a couple movies since we've got a proper Canon logo, but we got oh, one yeah. in this movie. And it was it wasn't good the, too. Yeah. And, and that's what I was going to say. Like I liked they, they put it, it was, it was the same like kind of like lines with a making a C, but it was all in kind of like blood red text. It wasn't the kind of, kind of goofy looking like shimmering blue that we normally get that you're yeah. familiar with. So it definitely fit the movie. It was, yeah, it was nice to see. Also to talk about the credits really quick, the actor who plays the killer, Warren Stacy, which doesn't give anything away because they put a write up on front street. His name is Gene Davis. I thought it said Gina Davis and I watched the entire film and I'm like, right? she wasn't in the fucking movie at all. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. I'm gl- I'm glad you noticed that too. I, I I went back, I actually rewound it to go like, wait, was that Gina? D-? No, okay. I realized it was a different person, but I definitely did a double take because like I had like there's some big names in this because we also see Wilford Brimley. Yes. In the credits, also he's not featured all that prominently, but he's in there. And Charles Bronson, I think, in this era was a b- pretty big name. Pretty so. big name. Yeah, I was like, wow, what a what a get for a canon movie to get Gina Davis, but alas. <laughs> it's gene davis so we open up the movie. Also good. he is really good in this as the, as the movie opens up we're in uh like a business park type area right a bunch of businessmen yeah. walking around and that's when we we zoom by warren stacy played by gene davis he was in yep. the film the hitcher as trooper dodge i don't know if you've ever seen the hitcher it's the no. rutger hauer oh c yeah, thomas howell sorry, I have. Film. Yeah, that was actually one that you had recommended to me around Halloween time. Yeah, it's it, that one's great. I love it. That's one that's on HBO Max as well. Go check it out. It is 100% worth your time. As we see Gene, or not Gene, Warren, he looks Warren, he, yeah. he's a he's a pretty normal looking guy, right? He yeah. I would almost like, describe him as a Ted Bundy type serial killer. He looks yeah, you know, incredibly yeah, he, normal. He's definitely has that look. And I, it, Ted Bundy is a good example. I was also thinking um, the Patrick Bateman character yes. in American Psycho. Kind of not quite that like super put together, but he's, I mean, he's a handsome enough guy. He's hes like well, seemed well enough put together. He's got like a pretty trim haircut. He doesn't look like a stereotypical like psycho living in squalor, right? He yeah. seems, yeah, well put together is a great, is a great way to, to put it. He's watching a woman go into a van. Now the van's being driven by, we would presume for the boyfriend because they kiss. And then it flashes to a fantasy of Warren undressing her. And then she throws like coffee in his face. He has this masochistic uh, worldview of himself towards women, right? It's like he gets off on the abuse that women give him yeah definitely it's and the way that the flashbacks are done is kind of an interesting it's an interesting thing because they're lit differently but they're also they're not super dreamlike so you're really not sure if these are flashbacks or actual fantasies and i think i think they probably meant for this but it was probably a combination of the two quite honestly and you know what that kind of goes back again to american psycho where patrick bateman is talking and everyone gets people confused in it you know is who's paul Mm -hmm. allen who's this and even patrick bateman starts questioning his own reality did he even do these things 
Yep. But yeah, by the end, you definitely see there's kind of a disconnect in his in his mind that's only getting getting wider as we as we go through the movie. And that definitely happens here, too. So Warren, he's he's at home. He's getting himself ready for the day. We'll, we'll see what he's doing. Um, he's he's in his underwear. So you get to see his moose knuckle for about <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, this this movie's definitely not shy, as we'll see about nudity in general, but especially male nudity. Which exactly. Is, credit where credit's due you don't see it a lot so good for this movie for for taking a risk exactly he he, as he gets ready he's still fantasizing about the the woman and he's twirling around a butterfly knife um and then he steps out into the day and he goes to a movie theater now i thought this part was a little weird only because the ticket lady had a lot of information that i would assume she wouldn't have had um yeah warren sees two pretty girls they're buying their tickets they're going into the movies and then warren comes up and asks the ticket booth person like hey who are those girls what's their name and yeah the ticket booth person like knew them which was kind of weird to me at yeah least. kind of i mean it's not not impossible sure but true I mean, yeah I'm sure, that, I'm sure that ticket attendant sees tons and tons of people every day i mean they just it seems almost a little too convenient that they happen to be friends but it, it, yeah I, I noticed it too but it was easy enough to overlook easy like, enough yeah, plausible exactly uh warren sits down next to the two girls in the movie theater and he starts kind of making a scene he's talking in third person about himself <laughs> talking to the girls one of the girls is not amused at this at all another one is super into it though like really into it and surprised that her friend isn't yeah like like because i mean he's definitely being a creep like there's no two ways about it he's he's creeping on him he sat right next to him he's putting her arm around her and she's clearly not interested in trying to get him to go away and the friend is like what are you doing he's kind of cute you should you know hang out with him and she's not like her friend's not having any of it the he warren offers some popcorn the friend you know smacks the popcorn and makes a giant scene and he kind of you know goes silent and he's like i'll see you later and i'll see you after the movie and the the two (laughs) girls move seats now even watching this scene i was like he's making a big scene to have an alibi i totally knew what he was doing you picked okay i'm i'm surprised you picked up on that i i it was total surprise to me as what was you know we'll we'll get into why but because he like it was so cartoony right i was like what is he doing why is he acting like such a giant asshole if he's gonna try to kill these two girls he's totally blown it he's telling me yeah like I, and i think i was so at this point i i didn't i wasn't sure enough about his character to know if this was within his level of stupidity to just be that sloppy and i kind of i didn't really give him the benefit of a doubt i, th- I assumed that he was just like a genuine creep and kind of couldn't help himself like this was what this was his actual personality i'm yeah, it's it, the way that they did it was awesome. Setting it up as an alibi, as we'll see later. But yeah, it, it totally it totally went right by me. So I'm impressed that you figured it out so quick. So in my notes, because the next thing he does, he goes to the bathroom and he puts on some rubber gloves and he's about to jump out the window. And that's when I wrote, I guess he's he made a scene to make him noticeable for an yeah. alibi. And I totally misspelled the word alibi. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, alibi baby. Pretty much. Uh, Warren, he's <laughs> jumping out the window that has some tinfoil on it for some reason. Uh, yeah, it's a really weird movie theater bathroom. Exactly. He jumps out the window and it cuts to like a forest area. Now, this was another thing where I was like, how does he know where these people went? But he's a creep, so he probably has inside information. I'm sure, yeah. He's in his car and as he opens up the door and he walks out we notice warren is buck naked yes he's he's driven out to the woods to where he we got flashbacks to and yeah he gets out of the car and he's stark naked in the middle of the woods uh with nothing but the gloves on it was great and i kind of i kind of expected more a little bit later from the kills which I, we can kind of touch upon warren goes up to behind the van and we get a you know, a little bit of the love making action that's going on, but it's not too sexual because we know, you know, what's about to happen. Warren opens up that door and he just immediately starts stabbing the hell out of the guy. Yeah. It's really, normally when you think of these kind of like serial killer movies, at least the bad ones, they, 
they tend to like monologue a lot and they like to play with the victims and like just do kind of movie serial killer things like a slasher movie where like it's long and drawn out chase. He does not waste any time. He, None. like you said, he just opens the door and immediately just starts swinging with that knife. And the girl is smart. She immediately bolts. So it's right. Warren. He's chasing this blonde through the forest. Naked guy chasing a naked lady through the woods. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty interesting, uh, pretty shocking. Sure. Uh, eventually, Warren comes up to the girl, and she starts saying his name. She obviously knows who this is. She's like, "Warren, don't hurt me. I'll do anything right. for you." And then he just stabs her right in the stomach. Yep doesn't doesn't say anything. Now, one thing I want to note is that the scene takes place during the daytime. All right. So now we transition after the murder. Warren is back sneaking into the movie theater and it's nighttime now. So, yeah, it it's, must have, maybe it's during that transition from day to night. Right. Yeah, that's that, that's another thing. Like, I, I noticed that, too. <laughs> it's it was reasonable enough to overlook. I mean, maybe I'm giving this movie a pass oh, because I liked it so much. But... I think I'm being super nitpicky right now. Well, I just want really? I think those are <laughs> the few nitpicks that I just threw out right now, I think are the Some only the ones that I have. Yeah, it's and, and yeah, like like you said, it, it was the 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 geography and the time transitions of this movie aren't always kind of like butter smooth, but it's easy enough to overlook because there's it's realistic enough that like you said, it could have been you know early evening and he was spent time getting back to the movie theater while the movie was still going. So yeah, okay, I'll, I'll buy it. Not not a big deal. So Warren gets back into the movie theater just as the movie's ending. And the two girls that he harassed earlier walk by him and he, he re-engages them to make right. a, you know, the, a further scene. So he makes a memorable impression. Yes. On kind these cinches, the cinches, the timeline for yeah. the, for the two women he's kind of harassing, which is pretty, pretty smart. Um, uh, you know, uh, got to make sure that they know who you are. Warren goes into the bathroom and he puts his, uh, his uh, bloodied rubber gloves into the toilet and flushes them away. Uh, okay. This is okay. This is my last net pick. <laughs> that would never flush. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I, I thought about that for like half a second. It's like, are toilets just stronger back in the eighties? Because yeah, like I, I thought for sure that would clog up immediately. Oh yeah. Or at least it would clog up and then come up later in a plunger. And then you'd be screwed because, uh Oh, these are bloody rubber gloves. Whose bloody gloves are these? I thought it maybe would have been a plot point a little bit later on, but it never happens. Yeah. Uh, we go back to the murder scene and there's a bunch of news crew cops showing up. Wilford Brimley's there yeah, in his cowboy hat. Oh, I, I saw when we saw him in the credits. I was like, I wonder who he's going to be because they don't really he doesn't have a title or anything in the credit in the in the in the beginning. So I was wondering who he's going to be. I, so he's like the police chief, I think. Yep, right? he's he, the he just he, works so well. It is. He, he's talking to the, the newscaster and he's kind of like, yeah, we've had a murder. We can't really go into too much detail right now. You ongoing know, investigation, ongoing investigation. And then we, all of a sudden from out of the the woods steps charles bronson he's like yes. in a tree greg his entry, <laughs> they're like bronson where I live. go into that spruce tree when they move the cadaver step out and <laughs> just walk out uh, oh by the way i noted this down did you notice that one of the corners taking the body away looked exactly like shia labeouf really oh my god i'll have to Go back, go back and look at it. Yeah, he's like a dollar store Shia LaBeouf. It's it's insane. <laughs> dollar store Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> I think that's where he's going to be working at from now on. Uh, <laughs> so Charlie Branson, he comes out of the trees like the Sasquatch that he is, surveying hey. the uh, the crime scene. He notices a piece of gum. Now this could be key Cheat critical evidence because there's DNA on this gum. But mm -hmm. no, it's just the other cop, Paul McCann. Uh, Paul McCann's played by Andrew Stevenson. He has been an actor for quite some time, Greg. Unfortunately, I think this is the only thing that I really know him from, but he did a five, I want to say five film series called Night Eyes, which I've never heard of. Never uh, heard of it, yeah. It was their erotic thrillers from the 90s. <laughs> I don't think they're softcore porn because this guy's like a legitimate actor. But yeah, yeah, he did a, a, a pretty big film series, big being surrounded by quotation marks there. 
it was they were it was a film series we'll yeah give him that no that's that uh, i was surprised that he he did a good job in this also and i was he had one he has one of those kind of like generically handsome kind of like manly man faces that i, I thought for sure i'd recognize him in something but I, I mean, yeah i i i I couldn't place him anywhere. I mean, uh, more than likely he was in an episode of Star Trek. Oh Hugging man, him. probably. Okay. I'm actually surprised he wasn't in more. He is very yeah. uh personable. You can like kind of latch on to him in this in as the everyman type character. Yeah, definitely. He he definitely worked as kind of a kind of a young upstart, up and coming detective for sure. Charles Bronson has the gum on a stick and as Paul McCann comes up he's like yeah that's my gum I, I spit it out hey I'm your I'm your dumb partner uh Paul <laughs> Bronson's like you should know you shouldn't tamper with the crime scene and he sticks the gum in his front in breast pocket. pocket of his suit <laughs> I loved it because you see such a Charles Bronson thing to do you can see Paul he reaches into there and he's like pulling out just gum the blot of gum <laughs> <Just> watch <it. laughs> Oh man, it's so great. Uh, they <laughs> what, a, what a dick move, Charles Bronson. Oh, but I he he totally, totally deserved it. Yeah, a uh, dumb. Move. They talk to Wilford Brimley a little bit, and they're kind of getting the scoop of what, about what's going on. They're like, "Hey, right. the the girl that's been killed is named Karen. Karen, like something, right?" Charles, yeah, I don't remember the last name. Charles Bronson gets visibly upset because he's like, "I knew her." my sis my not my sister my daughter was <laughs> friends with her yeah like because the we, we then like the next scene right after this is them kind of driving through some old, like neighborhoods and there's some kind of storefronts and everything he's like oh i used to live around here and that's when it kind of starts to clay's like, oh yeah like i i knew this girl she like my daughter was friends with her this is gonna be hard and you realize later that they're driving to the parents of that girl's house to I guess, inform them what's happened. Oh, that's got to be the worst part of being a cop right there. So brutal. Uh, meanwhile, Warren is at his job. I'm assuming this job, he's he fixes typewriters for a bunch of secretaries or maybe like data input people. He yeah, it was like a kind of like a big. It almost looked like a uh, like a news floor or yeah. something. But I assume I don't I don't think that's what it was. But yeah, it was like it was kind of like you know a ten desk by ten desk block of kind of typists basically so yeah I mean, it could have been like a data entry or some kind of transcription i thought it was going to be uh news reporters as well not to sound sexist until i realized that they were all women not saying women can't do this job but this is from the 80s and you know that they have a shitty job because they're yeah. in a big floor of like a generic office building yeah they're all kind of crammed in like sardines so that's the yeah, i think you're probably right I, like i think it was probably just like a like a data entry or something uh warren engages with someone who knew the uh the person that was killed uh i get you know they're like they were friends they were roommates and roommates yeah uh she she is uh, noticeably creeped out by warren rightfully so the guy shows little to no emotion throughout his his day to day interactions. Um, yeah, definitely. Again, you know, going back to that Patrick Bateman comparison, he definitely has that sort of like sociopathic look where he can sort of like pretend to be a normal person, but he can't help himself sometimes around women, and he just turns into a creep. Yeah, like you can people can just tell that there's something off about him. And, and clearly the, yeah, this, the, the roommate of the murdered girl is not having any of it. The seams start to crack. The mm -hmm. boss of this uh, floor gets a phone call that Karen is dead <laughs> and she starts like screaming in her office. And then she just comes out yeah. and announces to the floor. She's dead. She's dead. I, I, oh I wrote down here, damn, not even a memo. <laughs> like yeah, right like you think that she would kind of like slow roll that and like not like yeah like maybe like a written memo and not just like walking out of her office and practically yelling it to the entire you know uh, uh employee body like she's dead karen's dead she was murdered <laughs> yeah very oh God. a little little subtlety lady Come a little on. dramatic i kind of I, I i liked the moment because it was like a little bit of cheese on this on this was, film right a little bit of cheese on this delicious steak sandwich yes uh mm, so cheese steak. charles bronson informs the parents that their daughter's dead you don't actually get to see that scene no um, yeah you just kind of see him you see him ring the doorbell which yeah. is a weird doorbell like in the middle of the door it is right 
it it was really kind of weird. I don't think it's electronic. It's kind of like it's probably like yeah. a mechanical type thing. Yeah, literally like a little bell that you twist and it makes a noise in the house. Anyway, yeah, you like you see him kind of like you know knock on the door and the dad you know answers the door and he's like, oh I haven't seen you in forever and the wife comes up and oh hey how how's it going like they clearly kind of reinforcing the fact that he used to live around here and their whole family friends and they can kind of tell that something is wrong though when Charles Bronson doesn't really shoot the shit with them basically he's like can I can I come inside and yeah you, you don't see the the drama that would surely ensue after that but you do kind of see him walking out of the house afterwards looking depressed yeah <laughs> He goes to the uh, the victim's apartment where he talks to the the roommate, and they're trying to get a biography on her. They ask, you know, about sexual partners and the past and stuff like that. They want to build uh, a basically database of of guys that she would have been in contact with. Right. Uh, one of the things that the roommate gives up though is that every once in a while, a Hispanic person calls their apartment and talks dirty to them. Right. Yeah, wow. someone with yeah, she's like he's got a, he's got a Spanish accent and he speaks a little bit of Spanish and with English and just says horrible filthy things and I, I forget does she say that he doesn't give a name? She uh, she says that she doesn't know the name. Okay. So, yeah, she yeah, didn't know. We, we, don't, we don't know if Karen knew the name. Yeah. So they wrote down you know Spanish guy talks dirty stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Bronson he starts you know investigating the rest of the apartment, doing all the cops stuff and whatnot, and then we cut to the funeral uh yes at the funeral we see you know the victim's families we see bronson and his partner we also see warren looking creepy as shit standing <laughs> behind everyone kind of like looking around too yeah kind of case in the scene uh and then i thought this was really weird too paul mccann uh bronson's partner locks eyes with a unnamed woman at this time and they kind of smile and kind of give like flirty eyes to each other I'm, I'm so happy that you wrote that down too because i thought i thought that was a little weird too not weird weird for the characters like in the universe of the movie like, yeah why would why would you give some random woman you're seeing at a funeral it's not the place for flirtatious googly eyes dude <laughs> He's uh he's on the prowl. He's a young <laughs> hip cop, and he needs some love. I, I guess so. And he's he's not too shy to do it at a funeral. Uh, everyone's kind of giving their condolences. Bronson walks up to this unnamed girl, and we re we finally figure it out. It's his daughter, Lori right. Kessler, played the by daughter that was friends with uh, the murdered girl by the victim. Yeah, played by Lisa Ellabacher. She was in Beverly Hills Cop. She was jenny really? summers in that and she was also in a really horrible sci-fi film named leviathan uh, uh I've, I've never seen that but i remember seeing that poster that shows up on my suggestions on amazon prime a lot yeah because you you've probably seen you know some alien or some other <laughs> sci-fi film on there because we watched contamination last week yeah. that's going to show up even more now i'm sure uh, leviathan has peter weller in it so yeah you know it's bad but it's worth a watch worth a watch huh. you know if you, got, if you have some time to kill so as they're talking, uh, we, we come to find out that the parents tell Charles Bronson that there's a diary, right? Right. That, that she... their daughter kept a meticulous diary of, of every, all the guys that she went on dates with, everything that she did day to day. You know, I mean, God, it's, it's one of those things that people, I feel like, don't really do anymore. But in, in detective movies, that diary is always like, it's crucial. always the MacGuffin. Yeah, yeah. Crucial evidence that it's always so nice to have someone who kept a meticulous diary because it's like, it's a level of documentation that they really don't get unless you've got a diary because nowadays we're overly documented with all of like social media posts and just various electronic tracking means that back in the day, like diaries were all that you had and occasional closed circuit TV. So this was huge. Hell, I mean, Google just sent me a uh, year <laughs> in steps, essentially. Yeah, here's where you've been all year. Yeah, it was really weird. Things on a map, yep. Um, Warren overhears that there is this phantom diary, and he gets panicked because he's like, my name is probably in that diary, and it probably has the label Super Creep. 
super <laughs> creep, possibly going to murder me. If I show up dead, it's this guy. So, Here's his fingerprints and blood type and social security number. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Warren shows up to the apartment and he starts snooping around. Um, acting, you know, obviously super creepy. He's got his, his gloves on. Uh, the roommate, though, comes home and Warren gets into a, uh, a closet and he hides to hide. Yeah. And he Which watches. Way, I'm sure, um, what was he? What was he expecting? Because I'm, I don't think we saw the roommate at the funeral, but we assume that she was there. Yeah. And uh, they both came from the same place. Like, what was he like? How did he really expect that he'd have all this inter un uninterrupted time to snoop around the apartment? Yeah. You know, I've only been to a handful of funerals, but I didn't do too much after them. Right. Yeah. You kind of want to go home. It's a somber, a somber occasion. You're not really in the mood to hang out. Exactly. Kind of, kind of weird, but I can, I can understand he's panicking, right? Like he needs to find this. Right. Um, so he's, he's in a closet. He's watching the roommate undress. And she goes around, she gets some food. She gets a phone call from like her boyfriend. She's mm -hmm. like, why don't you come over in like a couple hours? You know, just let me relax right now. Yeah. Um, so this part, I kind of, it sounds horrible, but I kind of chuckled at just because of how odd it was. So the roommate comes back into the room. We all know that Warren is inside of this closet. And right. He, we get kind of like we get that first person POV camera too of like looking through this, this like the the slats in the in the door. Exactly. You can kind of see what's going on. Yeah. Uh he jumps out naked and stabs and kills the roommate. That means he was inside the closet getting undressed, Greg. Yeah, I think you see I don't I actually I don't think he was in the closet because I think you get at some point around the scene you see the clothes on the bed in the apartment i think when she went into the kitchen to start making food he kind of he came out of the closet and got undressed he creeps out gets undressed he's like it's murder yeah. time um <laughs> it's, it's murdering time because I, I i really liked i have to say i i liked the way that they did this the timing of this because you you see like he's hiding in the closet. You see her getting undressed. She's kind of like getting her pajamas on basically in a bathrobe and she's going into the kitchen and she's making toast and making eggs. And she calls the boyfriend, talks with him a little bit. Like it's, it's very mundane and it, it gets right to the point where you think, okay, this is boring. Like we need to move on. And I feel like for me, right at the point where I was starting to get a little bored by what was going on, that's when you get that surprise kill where he kind of jumps out and he's you know, like yeah. again naked and stabs her. I think that was really Looking back at it, I think that was a really effective way to build the tension for it because you're kind of lulled into a sense of monotony by her making breakfast. And then you you don't know when, you know it's coming, but you don't know when. And it, it definitely surprised me when he popped out and, and stabbed her because it was no, there was no kind of like him creeping up behind her. You just get her making breakfast and then a quick cut to him stabbing her from behind. It was really effective. You've uh, essentially described why I love Exorcist three specifically one scene in it. <laughs> um, and I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, Warren kills the roommate. He goes back into the bedroom and he forcibly opens up the drawer where he sees a box that says my diary. He gets like a little yes. smile across his face, but then he <laughs> opens the box. And there's nothing in there. <gasps> And you get like a good musical sting. Yes. And it was, it, 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 that was also kind of cheesy, but it worked so well because you knew that he, you can definitely tell he's panicking and you just know that he's freaking out as soon as he sees that empty box. It was really cool. And exactly. Now, Warren, he's going home. What I liked about this, they show Warren, when they, when they show Warren, he's doing these un mundane things, but he has these flashes of murder and yep. violence while he's doing these things so you can kind of get into the mindset of what this person's like as he gets to his apartment charles bronson and his partner are there waiting for him because uh -huh. these two are actually good cops oh my gosh it's so refreshing isn't it yeah the way that we get you know competent law enforcement because so many of these movies so much of like what happens in the plot revolves around the police making some kind of stupid mistake or oversight. It's so refreshing to have that not be the case here. Exactly. Bronson and his partner, they're making idle chit chat, kind of disengaging or, you know, um, disarming Warren. So maybe he can yes. like fess up some information. 
obviously Charles Bronson, he's the bad cop. The other guy, he's the good cop. Um, as as they're walking around his apartment, they make note of a few things, you know, oh, he like movies, stuff like that. You're into karate. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> I'm into karate. I like to exercise. They're like, yep, nothing, nothing bad about some good old exercise. Good old ex- yeah, really weird small talk. Just making, yeah, like you said, making observations about what they see in his apartment, just to kind of, I guess, relax him, like you said. Uh, then Charles Bronson pulls out the diary. The parents gave Bronson the diary. Ooh. And you can kind of see Warren's face drop a little bit when Bronson does the reveal of it, right? Oh, yeah. He, he gets knows. nervous visibly. Now, Bronson starts reading this diary, and it's about her, the victim's sexual escapades. Very awkward. Yeah, it's and they weren't kidding when they said earlier that she kept a very meticulous diary of everything that she did, and more importantly, all, all the guys she dated, because it's that's basically what it is. It's a catalog of, oh, I went out with Billy on this night, and he was very handsome. And then, yeah, he starts reading them off, and you can tell that he's getting more and more nervous because Warren knows that he's in that diary. Because eventually he gets, Bronson gets to a part where the victim keeps on writing the word, like this person's a creep, this person's a creep. And Bronson's like, do you know who that is? Here's a hint. You're the creep. (laughs) I love that. That's not my quote of the week, but I did like this one where he says, I'll give you a hint. It's you. Yeah, it's so great. (laughs) They just kind of like, Charles Bronson. they pull him in. And then just like oh, yeah. slam them down. You know what it reminded me of? It like this whole routine that they do it coming in and kind of like making making small talk with their suspect and just like try to put them at ease and then giving them like a quick one two punch where that they're not expecting or okay, you, you're confronting them with actual evidence now and you can totally see it catches him off guard. It's a very Columbo. I don't know how oh, many yeah. people who listen to this podcast also listen to Columbo I or watch Columbo. Love Columbo. Yeah, it's 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 a fantastic show if you can you know look past the age of it. But that's exactly what they're doing here. And for for a while in this movie, I wasn't really buying Charles Bronson as the sort of kind of he's not soft spoken, but he's a lot more toned down compared to Death Wish. This was the scene that that kind of went over the edge for me. Like that's it, it made me appreciate what Charles Bronson was doing with this character. Like I totally bought him as sort of a slightly edgier Columbo, basically. And yes. this scene really clinched it for me. It's uh, He does a very good job. Now, after they I- engage Warren, they start asking like, hey, where were you on the night of the murder? Now, this is again, like really good micro police work because Warren's mm-hmm. like, oh, I saw Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Paul McCann, the partner, is like, oh, that's the one with uh, Newman and McQueen. And... Warren's like, no, that's Newman and Redford. They're kind of like questioning him to see if he's telling the truth, right? Yeah, that, that, that classic ploy where you like f- slip in a couple of incorrect, some incorrect information to see if the person you're questioning catches on. Yeah. Bronson excuses himself to go use the restroom. Uh, Paul also makes another great observation. He's like, hey, you have this poster in Spanish. What does this say? Which Warren translates it for him, showing that right. Warren can speak Spanish. He's like, oh, you speak Spanish uh, a little bit. He kind of tries to like walk it back a little bit. It's interesting because we know that Warren is the killer to see this cat and mouse of the detectives trying to make sure that this is the killer. Yeah, I think that's another kind of refreshing distinction from the kind of slasher movies that we've seen before and watched, you know, for the for the podcast is that's that's always sort of the big difference is in these kind of detective movies we know who the killer is we spend a lot of time with him and the tension comes from you know you the audience knowing more than the characters in the movie whereas it's kind of flipped in the slasher movie where like no one knows any information about who the killer is and really the characters in the movie probably know more than you do because they can see the pov person that's kind of coming up to stab them i think they did this really well in that in this movie where they, there's a lot of tension in the fact that there's this cat and mouse game, like you said, of, you know, is the is the cop going to be savvy enough to pick up on these weird cues from this uh, obvious murderer? Exactly. It's uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting. As Bronson is looking through uh, Warren's oh, restroom, God. he pulls out a sexual relief device. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like you can plug it into the wall. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my God. It's which is it, terrifying. <laughs> it looked like, you know, those, um, a hand mixer. You make milkshakes and stuff. Yeah. You've got you know, different blade attachments. It looked like a fleshlight that was mechanically grafted to a hand mixer. It yes. was the most terrifying looking sex toy that you could possibly imagine. It looks like a practical joke. I, I, I wrote down <laughs> Bronson finds an old sex toy. It plugs into the wall. <laughs> I wouldn't stick my thing in that. <laughs> exactly. Don't stick your dick in that. Uh, <laughs> now, what's interesting, though, about this scene beyond the old style sex toy is that there's pornography also strewn about the toilet. Now, did yes. you notice what kind of pornography it is? It was like quick fly. I, I just remember like, it was like a picture of a girl kind of you see her butt and she's kind of like looking backwards at the camera. You I, I don't know. Wouldn't though. you, Greg? I did. Uh oh. I don't, I don't, I'm not braced for this. It's men. There are multiple magazines, and oh, it's was it? men. Men's wieners, men's butts. They're, I didn't they, even notice. I think wow. this is something that the movie does not play into at all. But, That's a nice little detail, though. I mean, if they didn't kind of lean into it too much, but I wish they'd, that kind of gives you a little bit more of a glimpse into sort of this guy's kind of distorted reality and his kind of sexual uh frustrations i guess i think That's interesting that warren is a serial killer of women because he's sexually uh frustrated by his own sexual identity and yeah, he's taking it out on crisis. women because obviously we've seen so far that he cannot talk to women that he can't uh engage them in any in, in any way right in in a non-creepy way yeah. and that frustrates him because he's not accepting his own homosexuality. That's an interesting angle that I didn't, it did not even occur to me. And now I actually kind of wish they did maybe at least have Charles Brunson take a quick glance and notice the magazines just to kind of give the audience a, Hey, this is something you should maybe think about. Cause that I think adds a lot of complexity to what we see him do pretty much throughout the whole movie. I think that, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting observation. I wish they'd, Wish they'd made that more obvious. I think it's since it's still early '80s to do that is a little bit taboo. The first thing that I can, the first movie that I can ever think of doing that is Silence of the Lambs, right? Oh, uh, Buffalo Bill. Yeah, yeah that's true. the sexual frustration, taking it out on women, wanting to build the women's suit. Um, this movie does <laughs> not go anywhere near that. No, uh, yeah, not quite that much. But uh, yeah, I guess again, credit where credits do. Good. They 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 clearly had that in mind when they wrote it, and they snuck in a little. A quick kind of peek at that sounds like, which is good for them. Exactly. Paul gets a a notification on his uh, walkie-talkie, like it's some like <laughs> kind of text. Someone yeah. someone walkies him. I don't know the old style lingo for this. I don't know. Yeah, you you hear the radio in his pocket start chirping. Exactly, and it's Wilford Brimley, and he's like, "There's been a murder." Uh, cut to them at the the. Uh, Oh, roommates. Geez, the roommate's apartment yeah. they find her dead they're all kind of just looking around they bronson notices that someone went for the diary right yes he sees the that box is kind of out on the bed right exactly uh they have warren in custody he's not arrested they're just interrogating him at this time and bronson's kind of putting the the screws on him asking Asking, oh, yeah. you know, kind of little questions at first that build up to a bigger thing. He was like, hey, you know, you went to the funeral. I thought you didn't like the the victim. And he was like, well, you know, I feel bad. I didn't like her because she was of loose morals. Yeah, she was mean to me. Haha, <laughs> which he's playing like the nice guy routine there. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, th- Wilford Brimley and Paul McCann are talking to the two girls from the theater earlier and they're essentially corroborating the story that yes warren was at the movie theater during the moment of the killing we saw him before and we saw him after the movie so it couldn't Couldn't possibly have been him yeah this was this is where i i mean i it seems stupid now because i wish i'd picked up on it but this is where it like really clicks for me it's like oh like that's actually really a really genius idea on warren's part is to to kind of set up that alibi for like the she said, saw me before this on the after I couldn't have left the movie theater, but like setting that up ahead of time and having it come back to play now where it basically gets him out of jail. Like that's, that was really genius and really big credit to the writers for kind of thinking that to, to giving the killer of the movie that much forethought, I guess that was, yeah, it was really, really neat touch. 
Exactly. We cut back to uh, Charles Bronson interrogating Warren. And he's like, you've never made it with a girl, have you? You're still a virgin. And he's like, you know what I found? And he pulls out the sex toy. He's like, you know what this is used for? And this is my quote of the week. (laughs) This is 100% my quote of the week. And I spent probably 30 minutes trying to record this, Greg, so I could play it at this moment. But my damn computer (laughs) couldn't work. For some reason, Uh it wasn't doing the audio loop back in order to do it. So he pulls out the sex toy. He's like, do you know what this is used for? It's for jacking off. (laughs) <laughs> Charles yeah. Bronson just screams that at like Warren. right in his face he's, he's like shaking it and the, 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 the fleshlight part of this is flopping around yeah. in his face it's the goofiest thing <laughs> it looks like a rubber chicken oh, just like yeah flopping around it's so awesome I have to say if, if I were Warren and that's I would crack at that point yeah. I would have this is just like so batshit insane to be having a detective waggling around my motorized you know yeah jack off device in my face <laughs> it's, like, Char- it's so beyond the pale charles bronson you know what he does with that thing right why are you yeah, touching it so nonchalantly it? put Ooh. gloves on we didn't even touch the business end of it Yeesh. yeah <laughs> oh god oh, horrible <laughs> uh charles bronson gets upset because they they excuse warren essentially they have nothing on warren because they they have he has a ironclad alibi there's nothing that yeah. they can possibly do to him yeah, so they like you know after the after the two girls from the movie theater corroborate his alibi, Wilford Brimley, yeah, like you said, basically just cuts him loose. Like we, we we can't hold this guy for anything. He's got an alibi and he's got witnesses who placed him there when he says he was there. We don't have anything to hold him on, so they let him. They cut him loose, and then they're in that. I guess they're in Wilford Brimley's office, like the chief's office, and and Charles Bronson is clearly upset. Like I know he like he knows that this is his man, but they just don't have anything to pin it on and. This was the point where I realized, like, oh man, this is, this was like the little bit of of Charles Bronson characters, like his his veneer, his veneer cracking, where he's he's getting frustrated with the system, and you can tell he's you know he's the the, the gears are turning. Like, what can I do to 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 pin this guy, pin the murders on this guy? Because I know it's him. Yep, he is he is without a doubt in his conviction. Uh, mm-hmm. Charles Bronson takes the sexual device and goes to the restroom to relieve. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did, are we watching the same movie? <laughs> so it's that was in the director's cut. It's the next day. Charles Bronson is talking to <laughs> Wilford Brimley. They're in the, the police precinct and his daughter comes in and is like, Hey, I need to give my dad something. Everyone's like, you got a dad. And she's like kind of offended that, Charles Brunson's never talked about her. There's a little father daughter <laughs> scorn there. Yes, distant relationship. Uh, Paul goes out and helps the daughter. She has a picture, and in the picture is Warren the creep and the victim, the victim's uh, roommate, and stuff like that. So the, it's kind of like right. building this. The net is kind of kind of slowly closing in on Warren at this. Time. Yeah, like you, there, this this picture kind of proves that they all knew each other, and he was definitely. He, you know, reason reasonable suspicion that he might be involved. I, and these are really good, like minute details too, that kind of like build towards something. And I think it's really great writing. Uh, yeah, for so sure. Warren or not Warren. Lori works at a hospital. She's like a nurse, and yeah, Warren is now fixated on Lori Bronson's daughter, as if we didn't see this coming. Yeah, right. What I found really weird about this is Lori Lori is going home. She's going to her apartment and they they live in almost like a dormitory for nurses. Yeah, I I was wondering about that, too. And actually, I rewound it a little bit to try and like find if there was any kind of information about that. I, I she says when she says what she does, she says she's a student nurse. Oh, okay. I, I so that, that's that I think that makes a little bit more sense of like why they would live in basically dorm style apartments I'm, I'm assuming she's in nursing school and she just does shifts as part of her training but yeah because it was it was very college looking but the women were clearly above college you know they were they were older than you know 20 years old so i think that kind of that makes a little bit more sense they were just in nursing school okay that makes a lot more sense then. <laughs> yeah because <laughs> Lord... they look like like the beds they sleep in they look like hospital beds don't they, they do because yeah when we first see it, it almost looks like a hospital room that they just kind of made up to be an apartment yeah so that was, it sort of explains it a little confusing now that now now that i got a little understanding of what's going on there 
uh, they all go back into their dormitory and Lori right. gets a phone call and it's Warren on the other end and he's playing Pedro or Peter in that's Peter in Spanish and he starts talking highly sexual to Lori about what he wants yes. to do with her and what he wants to you know do to her Lori obviously gets creeped out as if I would assume everyone would if they got a phone yes. call like Very that reasonably so yeah um, she brushes it off as just a creep and you can see Warren he's he he enjoyed it right yeah he got he liked, what he, he wanted. likes the chase he got he got a rise out of her which is exactly like you said exactly what he wanted um and then so we cut and it's charles bronson and paul they're they're eating lunch with laurie at the hospital right. uh, a really weird dialogue coming up here from charles bronson as they're as he's paying yes. for lunch he was like Lori's like, why did you get quiche? And he's like, I thought it was pie. And then <laughs> as he walks away, he's like, I also hate coleslaw. And he bought the what coleslaw too. Like, I was so weird. I I'm happy. I'm actually happy that I think I get more credit to the writers of this because as they were going through the cafeteria line, I, I actually noticed that all he got was like it looked like I thought it was egg salad, like a little bowl of egg salad, and yeah. then a slice of pie. I was like, that's a really weird lunch. And then the, right after that, the daughter called him out on it. I was like, oh, that's great. It's uh, it, I, it's, it's like these small character moments that kind of, you know, make these people a little more realistic. Obviously, he's not interested yeah. in the lunch. He's interested in engaging with his daughter. Yeah, clearly. Right? He's just throwing random crap on his tray. Just he, Yeah, like you said, he just wants to be there with his daughter to, as we realize later, to kind of get information because he's, he's worried about her. Exactly. So they all sit down. They all start having lunch and they're, they're all chit chatting. Lori gets, you know, upset at the dad because it kind of realizes that this is for work, not really for a social type engagement. Right. Yeah. Um, Lori invites the partner, Paul McCann to a party. And he's like, no, I don't want to go. We're kind of just like brushes her off. She, she looks scorned, right? She looks a little upset at this. Yeah. Uh, but then Lori tells Charles Bronson, hey, I got an obscene phone call from a Spanish guy last night. Uh, and again, dun, dun, dun. these fucking super cops. Paul is immediately <laughs> like, hey, you know what? I'll go to the party with you. And yeah. Bronson like shoots him this acknowledgement in his eyes of like, you caught that clue. Good right. On it was you. like, yeah, exactly. Like in super cops, that's like, that's a great, like compared to the, again, compared to the other movies that we've seen, they are definitely super cops. Yeah. The fact that he immediately <laughs> like pivoted to, Oh crap. Like he, she's the next target. I need to protect her. <laughs> Maybe, and it was like without missing a beat. Do you think oh, they're not great. super cops? Do you think that this is just normal cop, but because we <laughs> see so many movies with <laughs> bad just cops, the worst. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I have to believe that's at least partially the case because we see some really stupid police officers in the, those previous movies. I think, what was it? Um, I think it was Schizoid or yes. maybe it was New Year's Evil. I forget which one, but like there's this random woman who just walks in off the street and just, hey, I'm, gonna look, I'm looking for Detective So-and-so. And she just gets walked back into this room. And this police officer, he just starts showing this woman graphic shots of a murder scene for an ongoing investigation and just starts throwing out all this evidence to her willy-nilly it's like what are you thinking you guys are, this this is like an active investigation you can't give this random civilian all this information how do you how oh. do you get this confused that was the classic schizoid okay, right I, there. I was pretty sure that was schizoid <laughs> with yeah. uh dr frog face <laughs> yeah doc, dr frog face dr uh sigmund frog sigmund yes. frog that's right <laughs> Oh, classic. But yeah, you're right. Compared to that, anyone would look like a super cop. Yes. And I think you're, they, they probably are just, you know, regular observant detectives. Yeah. And it's so wrong. They get that detective title. They've earned that detective title. Yes, uh, we, for sure. We're back into the dormitory and we're, we're kind of getting not really introduced to all the other roommates, but there's three other roommates. Paul is showing all of them how to record audio from a telephone he's essentially right. like hey this guy he's giving obscene phone calls he's a creep we want to record it and i'm going to give you my a police walkie talkie if you get into any shit call us use this right. um very sensible which is I, again like yeah i'm like this is really good police work 
right? There, it's not like one of those dumb situations where the cops ignore it and they let the person be in danger or they, you know, they use them as bait, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, again, like in Schizoid, where they, <laughs> that was their grand plan was using the main character's um, ex-wife as bait. Exactly. Uh, yeah, like it's a very sensible thing. He's he's teach, He's giving them information to keep themselves safe without oversharing about why they're in danger or really giving like telling them that they're in more in danger than they really are. Yeah. It's, yeah. Really kind of, he does a good balance of, you know, making sure that they can protect themselves and get the information they need without freaking them the fuck out. Basically. There's a good couple of little moments here during the party. Uh, they're dancing together, having a good time. And <laughs> Lori's like, why don't you take your jacket off? And the music in the party, like it's changing tracks. So it gets like, really it quiet. quiet. And then he's like, I've got a gun. And everyone's like, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> Why does he have a <laughs> the, gun? The guy next to him is just like, uh. <laughs> She's like, oh, he's a police again? officer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, they, then they go down like a little hallway and they start talking to each other. A little little uh, sexual banter back and forth. You can very, very much tell that they, they yeah, are into, into each, each other. other. Their chemistry yeah. really works too. I think they, they work really well with each other. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't believe it initially in the in the cafeteria scene like why would she invite him to the to the party but this this scene later with them kind of chit-chatting and kind of her i think she like that's just like her type of guy i guess yeah and i was like I, I i bought their chemistry in this scene <laughs> oh, and then the next great part is you, oh, you yeah. hear some like shuffling some moaning some groaning yeah paul whips out the gun and, and busts <laughs> in on two people having sex yeah. and he's like oh i'm sorry uh carry on as you were and, <laughs> and the guy just pushes the girl back down oh my god i'm so i'm so happy you noticed that too it was such a weird thing to do like he's like because like okay i thought for sure he says carry on nothing you know i'm sorry about that i thought for sure like in a real world scenario that would be so awkward you would not oh yeah like that sexual encounter is done it's over but not for this guy he, yeah. he literally like you said pushes this lady back down onto the bed or, or a dryer or like a washing machine or like something wherever they were wherever they were getting at it, it it's just the most awkward thing this movie has like <laughs> really great little moments like that whether yeah. it's like humorous or it plays into the overall murder mystery aspect yeah. Um, Paul and Lori, they go off, they start talking a little bit more, you know, kind of chit chatting, getting to know each other, which I think stuff like this is kind of lost in modern movies right now. Uh, they they're so quick to move to action. They're so quick to move to like the next beat that they, they excise these small moments that really bond characters together. It makes you feel an emotion for them. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's, again, that's why I said before, like, I wasn't really buying their chemistry, but like this scene made me buy into the fact, that, oh, these, you know, they're kind of very different people. They butted heads at first, but it's actually like, you know, they're kind of into each other and yeah, this, the dialogue back and forth, I'm getting to know each other and asking about him being a cop and, oh, you don't look like a, like all, all of that banter back and forth, like you said, really makes you buy into the fact that these people are, you know, there's an attraction there. Exactly. Uh, as they're, engaging physically next to the door of her dormitory they hear the phone ring and both of them like snap to attention and they, they realize what they need to do so they go they answer the phone and it's pedro or warren and he starts talking to her extremely dirty but this time since paul is there right she gives it back she she feeds into what she would assume is the fantasy right he's like do you want to have sex or she's like yeah where do you want to meet and it catches him off guard and he gets not yeah exactly not expecting it at all extremely upset at this because he he gets off on the rejection so now that he sees a woman really wanting to actually have sex with him um it gets him very angry and he he starts doing the nice guy routine where he's like i don't want to have sex with you and he's you're like dirty you're believe me you're you know a slut yeah you're not even worth it and gets really belligerent which again, I think goes back to that sexual frustration, right? He gets off on being rebuked because yeah. ultimately, whether he knows it or not, women are not his sexual appetite, right? Yeah, yeah. He's kind of definitely uh, struggling with that. 
Uh, so Paul takes the the tape back to Bronson. They both listen to it, which has to be super fucking awkward for Charles Bronson because that's oh, yeah, supposed to be his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it didn't occur to me, but yeah, it's that would be kind of a weird tape to listen. I guess in the context of a, I guess you can sort of say like she was intentionally leading him on. So it, yeah, I guess that makes it a little bit better. But yeah, very awkward to listen to in a room with your colleague with you know in a room with all your colleagues. Exactly. So Charles Bronson, he ejects the tape and he goes to, okay, I think this this transition here is probably one of the worst because they don't really establish where they he went. He goes back to the police precinct. I thought he went to a morgue or something right? at first. That's what I thought too. The, 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 the look of the room had that, like there were like tiles on the floor and on the, on the walls. I thought it was like a hospital or yeah, like a morgue or something. Yeah. But yeah, it was, I guess it was the police lab, right? They needed that establishing shot of the outside building to give context to where Charles right. Bronson is going. But mm-hmm. a nitpick. Anyways, Charles Bronson, he walks in and there's a guy smoking dope at a desk, listen to headphones. You know, he's living his life. And uh, <laughs> obviously he gets scared because he knows Bronson's a cop, right? And yeah, oh, shit busted. Exactly. Bronson's like, hey, I need you to do like an audio comparison between this tape. Oh, yeah. And what's the phrase they use? Like a vo- vocal profile or something like that? Yeah, vocal something profile. Sciency pro- sounding. Put it through an oscilloscope and, you know, look at the waves look and at the see waves. if they match, right? Science. Um, so while he gets the lab technician to go to a different room charles bronson goes into the the blood room essentially right where they keep all the samples of all the bloods of all the victims <laughs> the blood room <laughs> I, 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 that's that would be that would be a charles bronson film right there <laughs> um oh man immediately i know what bronson's doing he's he's getting blood samples of the victims of a victim that warren killed and he's gonna plant the evidence in the future right i'm i'm I'm, again i'm impressed i i feel like a real idiot again because i in this scene i was like i i knew what he was doing like i could see what he's okay he's he's stealing a blood sample but i wasn't sure whose blood it was until later i guess i'm just the type of idiot who this movie was trying to target because this was and it just made it when it came into play later it's like oh that's what he was doing in the sample room that's awesome because at this point in the movie, I wasn't. I, I knew enough about what he was doing physically to okay. He's taking blood, he's stealing it, and he's doing it on the secret. Got it. I wasn't sure what his motives were at this point, though. I have seen a lot of detective movies, and I've I've seen okay. scenes similar to this. So I wouldn't say that. Like obviously, like you're. <laughs> I, I, I think there's there's two different ways to describe not knowing the action or motivation to a character, either. We'll just say what you said. You're an idiot or <laughs> you're so engrossed in the movie that yeah. you're you don't think about the future actions of someone. Right. Yeah. Cause I, and I think that's that's a good distinction to make, because at this point, even though I I wasn't sure what his motivations were and what his end game was, I wasn't it wasn't in kind of an annoying way. Right. Where there's a lot of other movies where there's so many plot holes and everything is confusing and you're 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 without information in in it and it's a frustrating lack of information but i wasn't i didn't feel that way at all i was like oh i'm sure that'll like that'll make sense later but it was just enough for me to to put a seed of doubt in my head like okay what is he doing there enough of a question to be engaged but not to be annoyed exactly it's not a sherlock holmes film where they purposefully leave you out Right. Yeah, and then have it all kind of come crashing down in one fell swoop at the end. This which would is be super annoying. Is showing you in serial order what he is doing without broadcasting, you know, on Front Street what the next action is going to be. Yeah, it's not. It's not immediately obvious what his end game is, but it's it gives you a little bit of doubt and a little bit of intrigue, which I thought. Yeah, it was. Again, I was not frustrated by this at all. I just. I didn't know where he was going with it. And it was exciting to kind of think about and figure, try to figure out what it was. Exactly. Uh, so Charles Bronson, he's getting all the the blood collected and stuff like that. The attendants kind of going like, Hey, are you going to arrest me for uh, the pot? And Bronson's like, Oh, I don't have any evidence. I can't do it. Um, <laughs> which is pretty cool on Bronson. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, so Bronson, he shows up at Warren's place. We don't see him do the act of planting the evidence 
but we know he's doing something in his apartment, right? Yeah. And and just like the movie theater scene earlier, like I very shortly after the, the lab scene, I figured out what he was doing. Yeah, you see him sneaking around his apartment, kind of you know, waiting for him to leave to go to work, I assume, and then sneaking up the stairs. And yeah, like like you said, you know exactly what he's doing at this point. It's like, oh, okay, clever, clever movie. Clever well Bronson. Clever girl. Uh, Bronson is talking to some of the other police detectives and they all agree that they're going to get Warren arrested for a vulgar phone call. They have acknowledged that the tape that they analyzed is Pedro is Warren, right? So they're like, let's go ahead. Let's get him arrested. Right. Bring him back in. Um, which is smart because that means that gives them access to the apartment and to, to gather some evidence as well. So right. as they get to the apartment, they're arresting Warren and... Bronson's like, hey, make sure to grab this set of clothes too. Uh, right. The, which the clothes he was wearing to the movie theater. Exactly. He's internally winking at himself because he has no one to <laughs> wink at. I'm the smartest detective in the world. Now, Paul goes to the lab attendant, the one who did the, the vocal match, right? And th- there's a little bit of dialogue between them. And it's kind of i guess it's kind of confusing i don't know why paul gets so suspicious immediately but paul was like yeah i was with bronson until 1 a.m and then the lab attendant's like well he came to the lab at 2 a.m and he that's when he asked for the tape stuff and then it, it was kind of confusing i was like why why does paul care about this part right now you know yeah, I think I, this was, I'm glad you brought that out because that was something I was th- thinking about a lot as the movie was going because you're right, it, it wasn't immediately obvious why he would be so suspicious. And and here's what, like, the only thing I came up with was the fact that earlier in the movie, you see McCann, the, the kind of younger detective, you see him openly disagree with Charles Bronson. Yeah. It's like, I was like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what we should do. I think here's what I think we should do. I think you, the movie at least established him as being sort of kind of like an independent thinker, at least to some degree, where he's not going to just kind of toe the line with Charles Bronson. He's at least he he, he trusts and respects Charles Bronson, but he's not going to like roll over and just agree with whatever he says, no matter what. So I think at least they they set up the fact that he he wouldn't leave anything out or intentionally overlook anything. So he was at least predisposed to like, oh, wait a second, that doesn't add up. And he would want, like, he would be the type of person to follow up on it, even though it was his buddy who had made the assertion that the, you know, the blood was there for sure and it was legitimate. True. So, All right. At least it, it, it seemed, it was a little confusing, you're right, but it was at least consistent with what we know his character or think what he would do. I'll go with that. I like that explanation. Um, as they're booking Warren, he's talking to his lawyer. They're kind of like, hey, don't worry, we'll get you off on this because. <laughs> double entendre uh <laughs> you know it's only a vulgar phone call it's not nothing's gonna come to it bronson comes in and he's like we got you the blood matches a victim and warren starts flipping shit this was like this was what really kind of cinched the 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 acting chops of this actor who played warren is like this was he's for the most part up to this point co- like cool as a cucumber and this he just gets he just goes off this was such a like a like a light switch moment where he just goes off and he just totally loses control and this crazy angry outburst he starts he picks up his chair and starts smashing it against the door after charles bronson leaves the room it was it was really well done yeah he's clearly coming apart at the seams yeah you can because he's getting afraid the the net yeah. is closing even more around him yeah um so there's a big spectacle in the I wrote town hall. I don't know what do you call it at the place where people. I, I guess that's like I, I wasn't sure. Again, that this movie doesn't do a great job establishing geography. I, I assume it was either like a courthouse or the police station. Yeah. Oh, courthouse. That's the word I'm looking for. Not courthouse. town hall. Courthouse. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so they're at the courthouse and everyone's kind of celebrating. They're like, okay, yeah, we caught the, we caught the bad guy, but there is still 30 minutes left in this movie. So there has to be some kind of twist coming up. Um, I, I, I made that same observation. Like this is probably the only time in the movie where I looked at the, like how much time was left. And it's like, 
this seems really early to be where we are in like what, what I was expecting to be the plot. And I thought that, I thought that was kind of a cool, it was like, oh, we've got more left. Something, something fishy is going on here. Exactly. And Paul starts getting hung up on a word that I, I can see as a being a good cop, he would, uh, yeah. but is still kind of confusing to me in certain parts because obviously Warren is wanting to get off uh, and be free, right? The, right. His lawyer keeps saying that they fabricated the evidence, that it's fake, that it's not real. And for some reason, this is sticking with Paul. Fabricated. Right. The ev- evidence was fabricated. It's not real. Yep. Um, Something, he's like drawing drawing some lines between the kind of the weird timeline that his partner, Charles Bronson, recorded and having gone to the lab. And, and then now he hears something about fabricated evidence. And it's just enough to keep kind of that that seed of doubt growing in his mind exactly so much so that he's he starts ignoring laurie he's he's sad he's not acting his normal self um right he's eating that, at him clearly because yeah. he's got that he's that conf, that conflict in his mind because like on one hand he's friends with this guy he's gotten to know him and trust him and he's like oh surely he wouldn't do something like that but on the other hand he's a good enough cop and he's conscientious enough to to like ah, but the evidence kind of points the other way and he's really struggling with that you can see exactly so much so paul goes back to the lab technician and they start talking with each other and kind of breaking down the night uh the lab technician they thought he was about yeah. to get in trouble for dope uh <laughs> what are you talking about what <laughs> exactly <are> you- <laughs> what are you talking about uh, oh, that was good there's a moment where he was like where where was Charles Bronson at when you went to go get the tape? And he was like, he was coming out of the blood room. That's where we keep all the victims blood. And then Paul starts adding more and more together. Yep. It's Um, all kind of falling into place. Warren is now getting coached by his lawyer going like, we might plea insanity uh, that you have two voices in your head, the bad guy and the good guy. And, you know, we'll just people eat that shit up. And that's how we're going to get you cut. That's how loose. we're going to play it. Yep. Right. Uh, Paul confronts Bronson before the trial because Paul is going to be called as a witness and he wants to make sure that he's telling the truth. Now, if Paul didn't do any investigation, he at no point would have lied. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's to, you know, all of this investigation aside, if he had just kind of, gone along with what Charles Bronson was saying to the best of his knowledge. Yeah. That, that blood evidence on the jacket was totally legit. Exactly. He would not have been perjuring himself because he didn't know. So he does confront Bronson and Bronson being a pretty stand up man. He admits that he planted the evidence. He's not, he's not wanting to, I guess, sow seeds of doubt inside of his partner. Yeah. I thought that was really another refreshing thing. And again, man, super cops, yeah. compared to the other cops that we've seen before because you know that in a in a worse movie or maybe not necessarily worse but a different movie a different type of movie the charles bronson character would dig in and try to find a way to, to like not get caught or to keep going with the the charade of the, of the planted evidence but yeah as soon as he gets confronted by this younger cop who you can tell is he's not angry he's disappointed which always makes you feel way worse yeah exactly right and he's he's like he he's clearly like looking up to charles bronson and doesn't want to like he doesn't want to disappoint this kid by you know doing a scummy thing like like planting evidence so yeah he immediately comes clean to the judge yep and yeah exactly he he comes clean to the judge and the case gets dismissed bronson gets fired from his job warren gets set free and you know you're like oh shit you know this is uh shit, this is free to kill again yeah this is all going sideways bronson is drinking with his daughter at night lori is upset that paul didn't go along with the lie either um bronson is kind of like oh if this was 20 years ago i'd have been you know i was had ideals just like him as well i can't really blame yeah. him um that was a nice moment between the daughter and charles bronson again un- like you said before kind of a nice character moment where we see them interacting a little bit more and like oh they like they they may have been estranged but they clearly love each other and exactly the daughter's try, trying to stick up for her dad and the yeah, dad's just like oh he's a good guy just let it go yeah oh one 
one of the things that I like, you know, obviously she's they're drinking, she's getting drunk, and he's like, I'm gonna drive you home. Don't argue with your dad. And she's like, Okay, dad. They can tell that the bond is getting uh reforged between each other. Yeah, exactly. And uh so he goes home, takes her home and and whatnot, and uh let's see here, drops her off, and then what ha- oh, shit. Bronson drops Lori off at his apartment. Oh, yeah, that's right. Then he goes home. And the phone rings and it's Warren. Yeah. Warren is now threatening Bronson that he's like, I'm free. I'm, I can kill anyone that I want now. Yeah. Basically gloating in, in, in his face. It's like, Hey, you, you can't stop me now. You couldn't stop me before and you'll never get me again. Exactly. Like, like, like flaunting in front of his face. And this is, I wrote here, Bronson is now in death wish mode. Yes. Okay. That well, we could talk about this after the end of the after we get done with the the recap. But yeah, like that's that's definitely a big turning point. That phone call is a big catalyst for what he does the rest of the movie. And I love these next few scenes. We see Warren driving his blue Volkswagen Beetle, and then up pulls in a Cadillac a smiling <laughs> Charles Bronson, and he's just the just, biggest shit eating grin. Yeah, he's just smiling at him and kind of taunting him on right. Warren is mm-hmm. getting creeped out because there's nothing scarier than a smiling Charles Bronson. <laughs> uh, that guy looks like he's got a death wish. Exactly. <laughs> Warren, he goes back to his place of work. All the women are commenting on how creepy Warren is. And we're getting, as he's walking through the, the floor of his office building, we're getting flashbacks of the murders and the women that he's chasing uh, it gets to a point where he goes back into his back office area and the the manager lady's like, what are you doing with all these horrible photos up pinned up on the wall? And he's like, I didn't do this. And it's photos of murdered women. Yep, it's the, the actual crime scene photos yes. from of the people he actually did kill. They're right up on the bulletin board in plain, in plain view. And Warren gets super upset and he looks out at the window and from a hundred yards away, <laughs> we, we get like a long zoom into Charles Bronson Charles, smiling again. All like on a bridge thing. Oh yep. my God. How great is that? So perfect. Like, yeah, the, this whole sequence that we've gotten over so far of like him just going out of his way to mess with Warren. Like it's a really great twist. It's like, Oh, like he's turning all this kind of creepy stalker behavior back on him and he's, Warren is cracking under that pressure. Yes. Uh, Bronson is staking out Warren's place. Paul runs up and he's like, hey, man, you're, what you're doing is kind of dicey because Warren could kill you at any moment. And he's like, yeah. you know, yeah, I understand what I'm doing. And he's like, we got to make sure that we protect Lori. They both agree that they have to protect Lori, uh, yeah. which shows that, you know, Paul's a stand up guy and still has respect for Charles. Yeah, there's Bronson. still some respect there. Like, he, he again, it clearly. It, it ate up at, you know, it, it caused him a lot of pain to do what he did to kind of call out Charles Bronson, but you can, there's still respect there. And like you said, they, they have a mutual uh, fear of anything bad happening to the daughter. Exactly. Warren goes into his apartment and there must've been some like trip wire set up or something because immediately oh, yeah. uh, music starts blaring. Uh, and it, it's a cue for Bronson to go to the payphone and he calls Warren up and he plays, you know, it's the, the roles are reversed. Now Bronson's yep. like, are you enjoying your night being creepy? <laughs> I love it. Uh, yep. Turn around that creepy, creepy phone call right back on him. And he does not respond well to it at all. So Warren gets out his butterfly knife that he hides underneath the sink inside of a pipe. Oh yeah, like in the in the U band under the sink. Exactly. I think that it's would good cause, hiding place. I guess it is. I think that would cause a little uh, drainage issues. But I think Warren's got bigger <laughs> problems to worry about right now. Uh, Warren is out on the night. He he realizes that Bronson is trailing him. Right. Right. Sees him in the rear view or something. Uh, and I was even kind of wondering what Warren's what is Warren going to do here? This this I couldn't like see into. The, I cannot prognosticate what was about to happen. Warren picks up a hooker and like in weird plain view, these, these prostitutes are not hidden at all. They're in front of this really well lit marqueed storefront in a big line. And there's tons of traffic around. This is a really strange city. Yeah. I wonder if this is what LA was like 
in the 80s was it just so up on front <laughs> street i don't know i guess so yeah they just did not care they got bigger fish to fry than small time prostitution uh i guess <laughs> Charles Bronson gets boxed in by traffic. He can't follow Warren. He pays a hooker for information. He's like, where does that hooker take her tricks? Right. And she was like, oh, this hotel, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter where. Yeah. Uh, so Charles Bronson, he's back on the pursuit. Meanwhile, Warren is checking into the hotel. He's got like a bottle of hooch with him. Yeah, some kind of cheap bourbon or something. He gets the the hooker to drink it. And I it, kind of confusing. But Warren's like, I'm going to go take a shower. I like to be clean before we have sex. It's it's really just him getting dressed and sneaking out, right? Yeah. He pours the, you know, he has her take a shot. He pours his down the drain along with the entire contents of the bottle and then, you know, flips out the window and, you know, he's gone. Bronson comes into the, the hotel room and the hooker is like passed out. There must have been some kind of sedative in yeah. there. Yeah, that was weird. I was going to ask you, so is she dead or is she just asleep i assume he didn't want to kill her he just this was all a diversion he just wanted her to go to sleep so she wouldn't you know raise an alarm that this guy just disappeared out the window exactly i think it was i think there was some kind of like sedative yeah in there sleeping or pill or something um meanwhile warren gets to the dormitory he strips down and he has a bundle of roses with him and charles bronson is now panicking because he realizes what's happening he has to yeah, make a phone him- call Gave him the slip and he's like, crap, I fell for it. Exactly. So he goes to the the door of the dormitory. He's like, hey, these are for Lori. I need to give them to her. Uh, while that's happening, Charles Bronson is making a phone call. One of the one of the roommates answers it. And it's just Bronson going, don't answer the door. Don't answer the door. As the door is opening, <laughs> Warren busts through buck naked and just stabs the girl at the door and kills her. <sighs> It was so brutal. And then this is another, it was like the, the first kill too, where you think, you know, in another movie, he would talk or say something stupid and cringy, but just like that door into the van, he just whips it open and starts stabbing. Doesn't even say anything. Doesn't leave any time for reactions. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, murder's not great, but it's great to see no monologuing. Yeah. It's definitely a different kind of movie, you know, Again, we watch a lot of we've watched a lot of slasher movies so far, and it's a it's a stark contrast in how the the killers are executing their victims. It's very different. Exactly. Uh, Warren tackles one of the other roommates, and he's like, "Where is she? Where is she? You know, where's Lori at?" He's very frustrated that he can't find Lori. Yes. Uh, they see a towel move in the bathroom, and Warren's like, "Okay, that's got to be Lori." No, it's just another roommate, and he stabs her unintentionally. Right, yep. It's not his intention to kill these other women. They're just in the path of where Lori is at. Right? They're in the way. His yeah, his his demeanor has totally fallen away, and he's in full panic mode, and he's just stabbing his way through these obstacles to get to his what he's fixated on at this point. And really, it's it's not even the same fixation that he's had with the other women. This is this is a revenge. He's in revenge mode now. Oh, exactly. A hundred percent. After he stabs the girl in the shower, he turns on the one that he's been like pumping for information. And this one I thought was like really creepy. She's just there in the corner crying, crying and cowering. And he's like, why did you make me do this? Why did you make me do this? And he slowly walks up to her and just stabs her. That, that we have, we should dig into that like a little bit because the way that they frame that shot is, you see Lori, she's she's hiding in the kitchen at this point. And her, her roommate is, oh, she's on a shift. She's not here to you know try to give her a chance to get out. And Lori is kind of like listening to and watching what's happening. And you see a like a POV shot from her from the kitchen looking towards the bathroom. And you see him standing in profile in the, just inside the bathroom door. And you, he does this creepy slow walk out of view. And then you just, you don't hear or see the murder. You just see him back away from a murdered roommate in the corner and he just like creepily slowly walks backwards back into the door frame and it was it, it was executed really well yeah really creepy it was very very good uh so now Lori has ducked underneath one of the beds and warren is just kind of walking through the dormitory he finds the police radio and gets frustrated and kind of throws it uh, i don't 
remember how he realized Lori was under the bed, but he like moves the bed over uh, and reveals Lori underneath it. Lori gets up and starts running. Um, there's a little bit of an exchange back and forth between them where Lori's like, my dad's on his way here. You know, uh, he's going to get you. And right. uh, he's like, I don't think, I don't think the director or anyone when they made this movie ever thought that this thing would be an HD, but he's like crawling on all floors. A, a, a HD transfer. Just imagine what you can see with this movie. Uh, yeah, like right Major uh, man gooch. Yes. <laughs> um, right in full view. Lori goes, she, she barricades herself inside of another room and Warren is trying to kick it down. And he just can't do it. Right. Man, uh, door doors in the eighties were just like bank vaults. I think they're like, made of, be, like not getting a dent in this door made of real wood. Right. Instead of like, uh, like the particle board particle crap. board. Yeah. All I could think of is even if, Warren is able to successfully kill her. His footprints are all over oh this door God. with blood. I was, I was okay. I was waiting to ask you about that because at this point, like we've established that he's his scientific approach to killing people is totally out the window at this point. He kind of he's, he's he thought it had to strip down, but he's so blinded by rage at this point that he's like tracking blood all over the apartment and he's stepping in it too. And I was going to ask you is forensic toe prints a thing like do toe prints have the same unique uniqueness to them that you could identify someone uh them? toe prints let's take a look here a toe uh since crooks are more likely to leave fingerprints behind the fbi maintains national database they do not record footprints or toe prints okay so that, so your finger that makes me think that's a thing each though. finger and each toe are different from all your other fingers and toes and they are unique to you so they could. Right? So they, they could like, and that's what I'm, and I'm so happy. I'm not the only one who thought about that. Cause like, he was like, you see him getting these big, you know, really full footprints on the door as he's kicking it when his feet are all kind of covered in that blood. I was like, I bet like the, you could do like a forensic print analysis on his, like his big toe or something. The footprint killer. The footprint killer. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like the fact that, that the fact that I even, it crossed my mind to think of that i think is a testament to the how good the movie is is like that's like that's within the realm of possibility for the law enforcement that we've seen it up to this point like they could they're smart enough they've demonstrated themselves to be smart enough to, to think of that it's like oh that's 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 kind of a cool touch yeah warren acts like he leaves the apartment it's all a ploy as Lori comes out, Warren re-engages her, uh, and she burns him with a, a hair curler iron on this cheek, right? Oh, yeah. And then she runs out. Uh, they're all... Charlie Bronson gets into the apartment just as everyone's leaving. Essentially, he, he doesn't see them, right? right he just, just sees them. naked women, dead naked women all over yeah. the place. Uh Lori's outside running from Warren. They're in pursuit. It's it's a pretty good. You got like the helicopter going over. You got oh, like yeah, all this... the noise and stuff like that. Yeah, like the the noise of the helicopter and the music kind of really pumps up at this point. And I, I really like this chasing. It almost had to, for me kind of a Terminator vibe to it. Yeah, the fact that there's this kind of cold blooded killer running naked down the middle of the street with you know almost no expression on his face, and there's this kind of you know, pumping almost like an 80s techno, you know, synthesizer soundtrack to it. It had a very Terminator vibe to it. It was a really, really cool scene. I agree. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very effective scene. As Lori is running, she eventually hits an object and it's Charles Bronson. Bronson's oh, waiting damn. there with his gun drawn, waiting for, for Lori and Warren to get to them. Uh, yes. Warren immediately... He's like, you know, I'm just going to play the uh, the insane card, right? And then eventually I'm going to get let loose and I'll be back. I'll be back for you. I'll be back for her. And I will kill you all. <laughs> and then they'll let me out and you can't stop it. Charles Bronson, the badass, goes, no, you won't. And shoots him 
right in the head as like the cops are holding him like they're handcuffing warren oh yeah like the jig is up at this point they they got their man yeah and this 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 killer knows how to get like to give him a little bit of credit like he still knows how to get into charles bronson's head and is clearly taunting him at this point and it just you can tell looking at charles bronson's face he's the character he's struggling to kind of keep it together and to do the quote unquote the right thing to like let him get taken into custody and go through the system but he's so disillusioned with the system at this point that he just he can't he doesn't want to take that risk and just unloads on him one yep. bullet right between the eyes it's awesome and that's how the movie ends yep that's 10 to midnight great ending really great ending really great movie overall yeah i thought it was awesome yeah me too this was another surprise to me i'm and let let me know if you're with me on this but i feel like this this is probably the best movie that we've seen since joe yes right like and just in terms of genuine uh writing and the look of it and just kind of a whole package yeah it, it has to be up there with joe i'm honestly like i had heard of joe before we watched that movie i'm surprised i haven't heard of this this one, I'm surprised, isn't on the top list of Charles Bronson films. Yeah, I feel like it gets unfairly overshadowed by his Death Wish fame because I think this is arguably the best movie, of at least of all the ones that I know of and have seen. Honestly, I think that this film, you know, yeah, it's way better than a Death Wish movie. And honestly, like, I could buy this if it was tweaked just a little bit being Death Wish, like the first one. Yes. Like, Okay, that's I, I I'm so happy you mentioned that because that's like that was what I was gonna I wanted to talk to you about earlier where, like, when you see that kind of twist when he gets that phone call after the murderer gets let loose on lack of evidence the first time, right? And you see that kind of light in Charles Bronson's eyes where he realizes, okay, he's like he's in death wish mode now. He's going vigilante. Yeah, I could totally buy this as a either a better death wish, like this is what we what death wish should have been. Or a prequel to Death Wish. Oh, because definitely. You see, like how how great of a lead up would that have been to like a kind of unhinged vigilante, where you see he started out as a cop working within the system, and then there's like it all it took is one case that got a little too personal, a little too close to home, and he just became so disillusioned with the legal system, and then he's like, I got to take matters into my own hands. Like I thought that would like that would have been a perfect prequel to it, like a Death Wish movie where you like kind of go into okay, he's in full action vigilante mode now. Yeah. I mean, I I thought it was I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, definitely. What did you think about the kind of like music and the way that the like the look of it? I thought it looked good. I um like I said, I think we talked earlier about how like the the flashbacks or the dream sequences they didn't have that you know we smeared vaseline on the camera <laughs> type the, thing. the shimmery the shimmery effect like exactly so i liked the is this real is this fantasy type deal going on that they had there and i thought the synth score and you know the the music overall was was pretty good yeah it definitely it, it fit it was probably not you know like a nicely orchestrated uh, score but it yeah it had kind of like a good mix of 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 real instruments and synthesizer and i think yeah it was a good, a good 80s b-movie uh soundtrack for sure the only thing i don't get it's called 10 to midnight why yeah. i i was actually that's a good question and now that you said something that makes no sense to me at all because it has nothing to do with the movie there's no I mean, there's sort of like that ticking clock element at the end in that he's racing to get to his daughter before the killer does, but there's no, yeah, I guess the, the phrase 10 to midnight doesn't really play into the, the, the theme or the plot at all, does it? Yeah, maybe it's like the metaphorical, you know, like, what do they call it? You know, the, the doomsday clock is 10 minutes to midnight, oh, like how close yeah. it is until uh, danger happens. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's, yeah, I guess that's a good point. I guess in, in that way, it's sort of a generic enough, you know, allusion to the fact that I think it's just stop a, this killer before he kills again. Yeah, it's just a catchy, <clears throat> it's just a catchy uh, name to get you kind of, you know, in on it, right? Yeah, I, yeah, it does have that kind of action movie sound to it. I can, I can imagine 
this being one of those cases where they don't really know what to title it and they titled it this way for marketing reasons. Exactly. They couldn't call it sexually frustrated killer. <laughs> uh, the movie surprisingly didn't do that well at the box office. I was going to ask, yeah. Uh, it made it's... $7 million off a $4.5 million budget. That's um, not great. A lot yeah. of it has to come around to the extreme violence and graphic nudity throughout the entire film. Yeah. I was actually wondering at the end of the movie, think, trying to think about it. It's like, I have, I've never heard of this. I wonder why. And the nudity kind of came to mind. It's like, I, I wonder if it was just too, there was too much male nudity, which tends to bump up like the shock factor for a lot of people, especially back then. I think I, I imagine it was heavily censored in other countries for that reason that you're probably right. That's, that's gotta be a big part of why it wasn't, you know, didn't have mainstream success. And unfortunately. I think a lot of, maybe some of the reason why we've never heard of this movie I would highly doubt that this thing could be shown on cable uh, oh, with how much editing that would need to be done in order to get it there. Because a lot of these B movies t- had their second life or really the arguably their, their longest life in, you know, like running on TV, running on cable, showing it during the week, like kind of like a late night movie. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this probably would have had so many of the critical scenes, the murder scenes, or, or him he's basically i mean it's, all, it's basically full frontal nudity the whole time because he has taken his clothes off to commit the murders like you can't it, it'd be hard to edit your way around that i guess exactly uh it's a shame because it's such a good movie i think uh hopefully it gets kind of a, a resurgence i don't know how but it, it really should <laughs> yeah. uh it should be i think like a, a good mandatory viewing if you're going to watch some of charles bronson's good films right yeah if you, if you if you're a fan of kind of serial killer movies movies like american psycho where it's it's more of like a like a cat and mouse between a, a smart detective and an even smarter killer if you like those kind of movies this would be up your alley i think and it's definitely worth a watch and i think that's important to note that warren was not a dumb criminal in this movie he was extremely smart like he was very oh, yeah, meticulous all, yeah. he just kind of got blinded by emotion at, really towards the end and he started that's when he started to get sloppy he got blinded by his emotion and underestimated charles bronson's ability to break the law yeah it's true he which is kind of interesting i mean you feel like he's sort of should have ex- expected that when he started tailing him. Like he, he's already been fired from the police force. And the fact that he started tailing him and, you know, giving him a taste of his own medicine, you'd think that he would be a little bit, give him a wider berth and be a little bit more cautious around him. But I think he was so blinded by, you know, uh, uh, I guess being made a fool by Charles Bronson. Like he, he was blinded by the fact that he was actually a legitimate threat to this guy. So yeah. he started to try and confront him and, and go after his daughter good movie though i'm gonna give it a four and a four out of five yeah I, i'm the same yeah between a four and four and a half i think really the the only negatives that came to mind are some of the things we talked about about you know the, the, the transitions between scenes aren't always all that smooth you kind of get uh, kind of confused about time of day and location a little bit but really like you said earlier those are nitpicks as far as i'm concerned everything else felt very tightly written and well acted and yeah, it was it was a really really great watch. Making the most of that HBO Max subscription because man, Wonder Woman really didn't. Oh, that's right. So I think this is the first one that we've is this the first one that we've watched that wasn't on Amazon Prime either for free or rental? I think so. Yeah. So if, if people who are listening if you've got an HBO Max subscription that's get, you know, gathering dust on your uh, your Roku or something, this is worth opening up the app to watch. Yes, 100%. Uh, I mean, yeah, I I think really great action film overall. So definitely, uh, I I highly recommend yeah, watching it. Not not cut from the, the the same kind of canon cloth that some of the other ones have been. Yeah, this was sure. high quality canon. It was yeah, and that's why I, and going about going back to Joe, which was the one of the movies that they produced right before the two. Uh, brothers from Israel kind of took over and made it to what we expect can to be today. This feels like one of those kind of movies. Like, and I think they were both producers on this one too. Right. Yeah. Like one of the, one or one or both of the brothers. So like they had a hand in it. It's almost like, 
it's one of those situations where a broken clock is is right twice a day. <laughs> like they're bound to get some things right as long as they get a good a good writer, a good director in on it. And yeah, I guess they this is a, a gem for sure, and in, in a diamond in the significant rough. And then there is another movie you wanted to kind of touch upon uh, this episode, yes. right? I, uh, so we recently ordered some movies from Vinegar Syndrome, and uh, there was one that was recommended by Greg. Yes. And I've got to say, it's probably one of the best 14 bucks I've spent on a movie <laughs> in a long time. It's Action USA. Action USA. I'm sure a lot of listeners have never heard of that movie. And, and, and that's I, I couldn't blame you for not having heard of it. It was 1989. Um, and it was doesn't really st- have any big stars in it. It kind of came and went under the radar. Um, directed by i forget his name oh no his name was john stewart isn't it john stewart that's right we were talking about how it was like this the john stewart no different different guy he was a a longtime stuntman and continued to be at work as a stuntman and stunt choreographer throughout his entire career but he i think this was his first directorial debut and as you can probably imagine by the title action usa is a a dream come true for not only action fans, but specifically people who are fans of quality stunt work that comes across really well. Yes. Um, and it doesn't look fake. And, and that, I think, I forget how I learned about this um, originally. I think I saw there was, oh yeah, that's right. So um, it's COVID time. So lots of companies are trying to engage in the digital realm and Alamo Draft House had started doing these Alamo on demand offerings and I, there was a a screening that they did of this movie action usa um it was like a live screening and there was actually a q a afterwards it's like oh you know i got nothing to do. it was like on a friday night and I was looking to watch a movie and it's like oh, i'll give this a look and it sounds like it'd be fun and the poster looked goofy because there's explosions and stuff and and i was so amazed at how much fun this movie was to watch and so I've, yeah, I figured it, it's like, I got to get this on Blu-ray and lo and behold, Vinegar Syndrome did a release of it. And yeah, we, we, we got these, uh, a slow, a slow delivery, but we got these in, in the mail uh, last week and we decided to, to sync up and do a live viewing and boy, was it a lot of fun. Yeah. Holy crap. I, I gotta say, I was so surprised that the, every action scene in this movie <laughs> was awesome yeah it, it's we only want to get too deeply into it but if definitely go check it out if, you, if you're listening and you, and you like action movies it's the best way that i can describe it is if you can imagine in action movies and you can tell like when they set off an explosion right and you can sometimes tell that the explosion was a lot bigger than what they originally intended that is the theme for action usa everything every stunt every action scene every explosion every car chase it's all so over the top and cranked up to 11 that you easily easily overlook some of the like weird plot holes and i mean really the plot is paper thin anyway but it's just so full of cool action stunts cool scenes cool set pieces and goofy like action movie dialogue character moments that it's just it's a it's a delight to watch it definitely if you've got a chance to to watch it with some friends either in person or virtually definitely definitely give it a look and max dad's in it from always sunny yeah oh that's right yeah gregory gregory cummings as yeah he's sort of in one of his few good guy roles he's yes a a part of a a pair of fbi agents who are kind of trying to get this woman away from harm because she was a witness to a crime and hijinks ensue <laughs> it's so good awesome Definitely. movie really great yeah, it's, recommendation it's it's one of those movies and this is what you know, when we were chatting before the show earlier I, I what i wanted to mention was like you know we have described in the past how we would occasionally go to these at the alamo draft house they would do this thing called video vortex where they would show movies of that ilk kind of you know lesser known action horror genre movies and it's always a good time because it's there's something to be gained by watching these kind of movies with a crowd and it watching this it was again it's a great watch no matter what even in the comfort of your own home but i can again this this movie action usa made me pine for the 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 before times the before covid times (laughs) where we could go to a theater and watch movies like this because 
and this is something that Becky mentioned to me after we watched it, is, you know, this is the kind of movie, like, they definitely would have done a video vortex screening of this. Oh, yeah. And it, it just made me so disappointed to hear. It's like, oh, you're, like, they definitely would have. And it would have been so cool to have seen this for the first time in the theater with a lot of other like-minded people. I can only imagine what the reactions would have been at some of these points. So. I was howling throughout the entire thing. It was It was that good. Oh yeah. It's just in howling in a good way. Like you're not, you're not really laughing at the movie. You're just laughing at how over the top some of the action scenes are. It's like, you just don't see things like that a lot anymore. At least not when they're not done in CG. How many times did I type wow to you watching this movie? (laughs) Between the wows and the WTFs. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. It was awesome. It was so good. So, yeah, again, I can't recommend it enough. I I think, I don't actually know if it's on Alamo On Demand anymore. It was when I saw it originally, um, but as Phil mentioned, there's a a Blu-ray of it that you can get through Vinegar Syndrome's website. Um, So go check out their shop and and try to grab a copy of it if you're into these kind of, if you're into that genre and you like, you know, kind of cheesy B movies and action movies, definitely, definitely pick it up. So we do actually have... A uh, piece of mail here. Uh, uh-huh. Phil and Greg, I loved when you discussed New Year's movies and had your Christmas special. I'm always looking for new movies to watch on holidays. According to every store the day after Christmas, Valentine's Day is the next holiday, which I actually went to the grocery store. I, I want to say it was like December 23rd and they were putting <laughs> out a, Valentine's that's Day. That's a ballsy shit. move. Um, yeah, I went super early to get the grocery shopping done. Uh <laughs> I love both the original and remake of My Bloody Valentine, but are there others you would recommend? Maybe you could do another special podcast. Uh, Ooh, another so holiday episode. I think it's, uh, I think, you know, Valentine's Day is definitely a good uh, breeding ground for, for horror movies. And we unintentionally, unknowingly did one, actually. Uh, x-ray hospital massacre that was set on valentine's day oh that's right oh, see it was so subliminal that we don't I, even yeah, remember they not, it's coming back to me now though because i feel like we talked a lot of we think we talked about that at least a little bit in the review where we said why didn't they lead into the valentine's day thing more like that's a that's a known popular trope is to to frame a horror movie or a slasher movie around a horror like a holiday theme yeah that's right i forgot about that Dang, we should have, too bad we couldn't have saved it. Oh, well. So there was one, I I Googled uh, Valentine's Day movies uh, horror. Now, I have seen this one. This isn't just a blind recommendation. I'm not even recommending that you watch it, though. Um, (laughs) Because. Aware of its existence. Yeah, I I remember this film not too fondly. Um, but if you want to watch a romantic zombie black comedy film, there's the 1993 film, My Boyfriend's Back. I, I, I don't know why, I, oh, man. but I vividly remember That's my parents back. renting this and us watching it together one night. Uh, That's like, I, I, yeah, talk about nostalgia. I, rem- I can almost visualize the cover, the VHS cover to that. I feel like that's something I saw in probably a blockbuster or something. Yes. And just never rent is like, oh that's kind of a weird cover moving on now uh if if you want some reason to watch it it's not going to be for the actor andrew laurie or tracy lind who play johnny and missy the the main actors in this movie it's going to be for the smaller people the guy the character named buck van patten who's played by matthew fox of lost fame or what about Chuck Bronsky, played by and credited by, credited as Philip Hoffman, full name Philip Seymour Hoffman. No shit. Who could ever forget the monumental uh, performance of <laughs> Guy Number Two, portrayed by Matthew McConaughey? Wow. And live in total oblivious as scenes cut by Renee Zellweger. That's right. One of Renee wow. Zellweger's first films. And she My got boyfriend. left on the cutting room floor. Jeez. There's a lot of uh, current star power in the background of that garbage 90s movie. Yes. <laughs> and what's even well. weirder is looking at the film. It's produced by Sean S. Cunningham, a Friday the 13th fame. But it's directed by Bob Balaban. 
Now, Bob Balaban, when I look at him, I'm immediately remembered of Seinfeld. He plays uh, one of the NBC execs that they're trying to sell the movie within the movie to. I didn't know that he was a director as well, but huh. I looked at his crediting and he has directed quite a few uh, TV type things. Oh. But good for him for getting into features then. There you go. There is well a done. sort of Valentine's Day recommendation for you. My boyfriend's back. Uh, I don't even know if this is on DVD. I got to be honest. You might have to yeah, find a VHS. I, yeah, I was going to say, I definitely know there's a VHS. I remember seeing that when I was a kid, but yeah crack out that old uh vhs player that you got sitting in your basement and check it out because it sounds like there's a uh a sad lack of valentine's day themed horror movies that you haven't already seen exactly well there you go i think the the next film we've we've got queued up here in the old uh the old cannon hopper the old cannon hopper is house of the long shadows this is a 1983 comedy horror directed oh. by peter walker um it's notable because it has four horror icons in it vincent price christopher lee peter cushing and john carradine i wouldn't really consider john carradine to be a horror icon no uh, john carradine being the father of uh david, david and keith and robert carradine of the, the carradine empire okay um but yeah so that's our next one's going to be a horror comedy. Yeah, I think I was going to say, I think that's the first we've had of that kind of genre mix so far. Yeah. So pretty interesting. I, I'm a big fan of Vincent Price, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. So I, uh, I accept this film. Yeah, as our... that sounds like it could be could be promising. Is that that's on that's on Prime also? That's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. The mark of quality when no one cares enough about the of the intellectual property to take it down off of YouTube. I mean, that's how we saw Freaked, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so there we go. So give it some love, give it some views on YouTube, and and check it out. Maybe we'll get a blue come back release and of it one day if we we if we watch it enough on YouTube. Maybe we'll get a blue ray release of it. Hammer hammer that refresh button and watch it on your phone. <laughs> watch it on your on your PC. Like, subscribe, and comment down below <laughs> it perfect uh what's the uh what's the quote of the week the quote of the week i think so i picked this when i heard it in the movie but little did i know it would have so much impact and relevance to how the movie ended um if you remember the scene kind of midway to maybe two-thirds of the way through between warren and his lawyer and their the lawyer is basically saying listen the insanity defense you may not like it but that's like what popper our best shot at winning this trial and you know, they're kind of discussing what they would do is, oh, you've got two voices inside of you. And, and Warren, you know, replies to this and says, so you're saying I'm a schizo. And the lawyer responds says, no, Warren, I'm saying that you'll walk out of a crazy house alive. They'll carry you out of a gas chamber dead. I'm not insane. I know that. But in case we have to go that route, I just want you to know that we're in pretty good shape. No matter what you've done, the worse it is, the more the jury is going to think that no normal person could have done it. You follow me? So we work out a routine. Say you're two people. One good, one bad. You start hearing voices. The bad boy telling the good boy what to do. He doesn't want to do it, but he can't help himself. You see? You're saying I'm a schizo. No, Warren. I'm saying that you'll walk out of a crazy house alive. They'll carry you out of a gas chamber dead. Good quote. It was so, I just thought it was kind of a, it's such a, like a lawyery thing to say, like making such light out of two horrible things to have happen to you. I mean, he deserved it in this case, but like just the way that he rationalizes pleading insanity, it, it, it was just kind of a, an interesting quote to me at the time. But the fact that that's how the movie ended with Warren throwing the insanity defense into Charles Bronson's face as like a, you can't stop me. I'll just plead insanity and it'll work and I'll be, I'll get out and I'll come for you. I was like, Oh, that's, I'm so happy that we kind of came full circle on that. He's like embracing that horrible, horrible option. Cause he's clearly, he wants to live and he wants to come after Charles Bronson. So yep. that's his motivation yep. for living. Good yes. Quote. 
good quote. Usually the quotes are good because they're they're goofy, but that's a good quote because yeah, it's a damn good quote. Good good quote for a good movie. All right. Well, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. Give us some constructive criticism on how we can make this podcast more enjoyable to you. Uh, go ahead and write us an email. Obviously, I'm going to read them. You can yeah, email I love us. Those emails. Exactly. You can email us at that's canon at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at that's canon. You can read all my one sentence reviews and <laughs> all my goofy replies to people acting insane on oh, Twitter. Yeah. And remember, since we said it, that's canon. All I need somewhere I can have total isolation and above all, atmosphere. What lives in this house? No one would want to live in Balpatermana. What stalks these halls? It's a cursed place. Yes, I saw the movie. What hides in these shadows? And who is playing that piano? <coughs> Welcome to the house of the long shadows.